Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO, The Last Days of Europe, in which we are playing as the Ural Military District, also known as Svedlosk. So if you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. Um, we will be led by, what was it, Orokosovsky, in which we are playing in Western Siberia, a region I normally don't play in because a lot of the countries here either don't have content or they're not unifiers, and they just kind of exist, especially like a certain brigade down here. And Magnitorgosk, but let's begin with the Bastion of Freedom. Russia is broken. It was shattered without mercy by the N-word firepower even now. In the afterglow of their victory, the N-word planes scream and rattle overhead, sneering at us while they destroy our cities and murder our children. Oh boy. But it's also torn apart from within by traitors, collaborators, men without loyalty or principles, men who live only to sate their lust for power and blood. Our motherland was destroyed and from deep within these abysmal Abyssal fractures, evil and tyranny poured forth, sweeping away what little we had left. Svedlosk stands as a bulwark against this black tide, a candle in the dark, and the last bastion of freedom. We will fight with every drop of blood in our bodies to preserve our freedom, which get exactly four and a half stability. And then look around you. Look around you, fellow Russians. Tell me, what do you see? Do you see devastation, the sickness, the death, the anarchy, the chorus of death that rings from Akhangos to Kamchatka? Do you hear the cracking of hooves on stone and the great horns louding the horsemen's approach? Do you see the madness just beyond our borders? What if the North, where the word of a petty criminal's law, would have two men, whose people are slaves to terror, and Omsk, whose leadership would have millions slaughtered in the blink of an eye in the name of revenge? If you do, my fellow Russians, then you see why we must preserve our freedom. And they that cool. That's actually a really cool uh icon there. Look at that, that looks so nice. I love the shield. The bottom bogatier, if you like about that, please go right ahead. An interesting story, if nothing else. And it's time to scam for loot, because we love losing as a Russian warlords. Dear Anna. Pavel put the sealed envelope aside and reached for the stack of reports on his desk. He pulled one from the top and carefully read it over. Maxim Pal Pavlovich Karjagin, born the thirtieth. Uh, well, I guess technically February 30th, 1934, 214th Battalion, 52nd Regiment, 139th Rifle Division, KIA, and a skirmish south of Kamensk, Oralsky. He flipped the report over and sighed sadly. Married two children, both four years old. Oh, wow. Drawing his pen from its inkwell, he plucked a piece of paper from his stationery and began to write. Please accept my dearest and most genuine sympathy on your loss of your husband. Another letter. Another tragedy. Nothing he could write would ease her pain. How could words describe the indescribable? The sorrow, the fear, the anger. Maxime died for no reason, killed by a faceless enemy and reduced to a name and photograph on a piece of paper. But it was so much more than that. A soldier, a lover, a husband, a father, now just a corpse. How many more would die before Russia was reunited? How many more letters would have to be written? The thought made Pavel's insights turn. Maxime was a hero that not only the soldiers with him, or with whom, he served but all of Russia. I wish you and your family the very best as you deal with this unthinkable tragedy. If there's anything I can do to ease your pain, I welcome that opportunity. Pavel folded up the paper and slid it inside the envelope, sealing it with a wax stamp. He put the envelope aside and reached for the stack of reports on his desk with deepest sympathy, Pavel Ivanovich Batov, in which we have nothing here you too unique for our nation. Sometimes some of the warlords have unique little uh, things you can do with your political power, but for this nation it's, we don't, and that's totally okay. Actually, I do, I, the one thing I do like about the western part of Siberia here is that we could probably do pretty darn well against our neighbors. Just because free aviators, you grow, probably won't have that much strength, even though neither do we. Hm. These guys are 15 combat with, which actually has anti-tank, which is actually something we're going to really, really need immediately. These guys have no anti-tank, and then we got two military divisions, which means we're not that strong. They do have recon, but we're not that strong, honestly. And that's not very good for us, because I'm a little worried about... A couple guys down south of us, including two men and Omsk, but especially two men, because I think they do have armor, which is not going to be very good for us. But look around you. A morning meal in the district. Squint peered into the bottom of the cast iron pot, to the muddy soup that coated its innards. Beans stuck to its form like pearls among a choppy sea. Squint had to admit that it was not very nutritious nor filling, but food was food. He lifted his gaze to the line of men, women, and children who awaited their daily ration of bread and soup. He sighed. It was probably not enough either. Squint looked at the metal plate platter beside him, the few crumbs blurring with a dull, slate-colored surface. Soup behind him said, squeaker, there was a croot whose rifle was unslung. Occasionally, the private had to yell in a high-pitched squeal to keep the crowd in order. Without that rifle, the men and women in that line would have laughed at Squeaker's voice. Hey, Squint said, catching the newcomer's eye. 
Do you need help? Do you want to swap the new guy? No, Squeaker tightened his voice, trying to sound beyond his ears. I'm fine, I can do this. The kid got dropped into a squad full of mean-faced veterans and was trying to sound like he belonged there. All the others didn't like him much, but Squint saw some grit in Squeaker's demeanor. I desire to live above and beyond the call. Give him time, Squint said to Baker. Give him time. If you say so, Squint wasn't much either at the start. He could hardly see, hence the name Squint. His breath fogged up his barely fitting prescription glasses, and he took them down to clean them. He heard a whirr, whirr, and a roar overpowering the din of the crowd. German Squeaker screamed, his voice shrill with terror. Duck, duck! Wasting no time, Squint dropped the spectacles and lay still, his heart beating the cavity of his chest down. Buzzing and then silence, it took a good few minutes before the procession could continue. Just another morning in the military district. Get some more authoritarian democracy, stability, and political power. And look around you, and which we'll do, which one? We'll, ah, stability is always good to get. Throughout Russia, the grief of the Germans cause cannot be more apparent. The former Union, shattered into pieces, cannot protect its people. With the bombs falling from the sky, all that reside below know only panic and fear. Dreams of liberty, freedom, and plenty can do not but die, torn by shrapnel and force. All the motherland, from the west to the east, face a plague even more sweeping than any anger or disease. Hopelessness. That life will go on as it had before, under terror and violence. At the lands of West Siberia, however, a lone beacon of hope remains, smothered in the cold and left to die in the fall of the Union, yet refusing to die. All who would dare rise to challenge fate, the doors to the Marshal's army remains open. To those who hope, to those who refuse to surrender the innocent wish for a better tomorrow, the military district shall welcome as comrades in arms as in its march to an ideal future. Sounds promising, and three ordinary dissidents. To the other patrons of the bar, the three men were unremarkable, impossible to pick out in a crowd. They were banking on that, after all. Boris Yeltsin, Yevgeny Primakov, and Alexander Tiziakov seated themselves in a booth, ordered the drinks, and got to talking. We have to be bolder, Boris said. I have been to the protests. There are thousands of people in the city alone who believe change is possible, that democracy is possible. We have to spread the word that its government does not represent them. True liberty gives the people ballots, not bullets, and to do that, we need to push more newspapers and hold more rallies. Both of his associates stumbled over one another, trying to respond first. Two of my guys were jailed last week for distributing provocative literature, Yevgeny said. If we start promoting what is effectively chosen, they might shut us down for good. And that means I'll go to prison too. Think about our, express our expenses, Bodia. Alexander said newspapers and flyers are expensive. Rallies are even more expensive. We can't keep pulling money from my contacts without Rokosovsky noticing. Then he follows the paper trail and we... I get it, I get it, Boris said, waving his arms to dispel the conversation as if the cigarette smoke. Of course we have to be careful, but we have to push the envelope here. We have a real shot at building democracy in Russia. We can't squander it. The waiter arrived with a drink shortly after. Boris raised his small glass of whiskey and smirked at his co-conspirators. A toast to freedom. More conservative democracy, as well as Boris Yeltsin becomes the leader of the conservative party. Cool. Or really conservative democracy, but not so Red Army. Private Dmitry Sergeyevich Chernov chewed the taste of cafeteria meat. He had been conscripted several years before and could still remember the Third Army's revolution against two men. What he couldn't remember was a day since when the food had, been any, had any flavor. He turned to his friend, Private Morozov, who had, been, who had been in the army as long as he has. Do you think this is, isn't is really what socialism is like? I mean, they told us after the revolution anyone would, everyone would be free. But since then, we've been eating the same crap and being yelled at by the same officers like before. Moro Morozov smiled as he lit up a cigarette. Sergeyevich, I gave up on these foreign lies a long time ago. A few months back, I started reading the pamphlet Alexevich gave me. It told me about the true path to avenge those who tortured the motherland and the prosperity all Russians will enjoy once we vanquish those enemies who had wronged her. Can I see that thing? Just curious, asked Chenov. Morozov took out a small battered pamphlet out of his coat pocket. The Black League, the rebirth of Russia, said the letters atop. The Black League's shadow lengthens. Ooh, that is not good. Death and Liberty. Nadia uh, heaved the pot of water onto the stove and twisted the burner onto its highest setting. That's when she heard it. It was a voice flowing in through the open window next to her. A stray gust of wind filled the curtains. She pushed past them and stuck her head out the window. Her senses burst with detail. A large crowd squirmed along the Sverdlov statue on the street below, spilling over into the road. The voice belonged to a middle-aged man standing on a small wooden platform in the center of the crowd. Between the mumbling of the crowd, the honking of horns, and the hiss of the water on the stove, she couldn't make out every word of what the man was saying, but she heard his voice. He was emphatic. Booming passion, he spoke of liberty and how Rokosovsky had robbed the moment. He paused and the crowd cheered. She did too. Democracy, what an incredible idea. Two black trucks screeched to a halt in the roundabout, their blue and white lights flashing. The back doors opened and the black clad figures poured out. Nadia's insides twisted. Her fingers gripped the sill. A second voice cut in, amplified by a loudspeaker. It snarled, demanding that the crowd disperse. The response is calling him a fascist, a tyrant, a Hitlerite. Drowned out his demands. A middle aged man was gone. A few of the black figures. Lobbed smoking canisters into the crowd. The figure front of the crowd recoiled backwards. Gunshots. The men in black surged forward, screaming. 
Nadia stepped back from her window. She was shaking. Her hand struck the side of the pot and it slid off the stove, spilling boiling water into her leg and cl clattering on the floor. She cried out. A string of profanity slipped through her teeth as a wave of pain swept over her, making her dizzy. The unmistakable sound of truncheons on flesh, interspersed with gunshots, filled the street below the sounds of life ebbing. Liberty comes at the cost of democracy. And it looks like... Okay, so we'll talk about that, but we need to talk about the National Spirits. Lufamo terror bombing, not very good. A not so red army, even though he was basically from the red army. If you like about him, please go ahead. He's a lion of Siberia. We also have medium revisionist influence, as well as medium black league influence as well, which is not very good. Our government consists of nothing but Rokosovsky's most loyal and talented comrades in arms. The same cannot be said of the rest of our armed forces. Our current army is populated with conscripts who defected from Tiamen involuntarily. That is, they landed on our side of the border when the dust settled. Many of them still hold favorable feuds towards Tiamen and even Kaganovich himself. But even more pervasive and pressing issue is the uptick in reported cases of Black League propaganda being found in all barracks across the country. Foreign agents in our armed forces will not be tolerated. Treasonous or unreliable actors must be ex excised like a disease they are, lest they revolt and destroy our nation from within, from the inside out. Or Black League influence. Oh boy. Crack down on the Black League. We probably want to do that. So we lose uh, political power. We lose 100 manpower, basically. So it's not too bad. Um, why can't we select this? Maybe to give it one more day. There you go. Nice. Um, honestly, with this stuff here, Black League... I'm more worried about uh, these guys. Two men first, because they're ne right next to us, so... Um... Yeah, this one. Because these guys are known as two men in the Western group. So, Ultra Nationalism. Yeah, let's do that one first. I don't want to spend our PP, but we're going to have to. Now let's get some equipment, shall we? Anyone have loot? No, 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 no. You guys don't have loot? Okay, then. Look all around you. Hey, look, Boris Yeltsin. Cool. <clears throat> and here's our social development. Academic base is going down slowly. Research facilities are zero. Agriculture is zero. Poverty is going down. Equipment is going down. Expertise is going up. And everything else is kind of staff. Standard. No justice, no peace. We have observed a distinct and disturbing rise in civilian discontentment amongst our government as of late. Incidents of vandalism, sabotage, and even physical confrontations with police or military personnel have been reported all across our nation. However, most of these incidents have occurred within Slavovsk itself, which should be no surprise. <clears throat> The most probable cause of this wave of unrest is the recent 46th Prospect Lenina incident, which led to the deaths of 6 and injured 10 others. Details are spotty at best, but all reports suggest it began in the morning when a mob of civilians assembled unlawfully to listen to a speech from a political fugitive whose identity is yet to be determined. The local garrison responded approximately half an hour later. They announced the assembly was illegal and ordered the mob to disperse. The mob reportedly responded by throwing bricks. When tear gas was employed to prevent any further violence or property damage, they attacked soldiers with chains and steel pipes. The would-be riot ended when the garrison opened fire despite having no explicit orders to do so. Marshal Rokosovsky and the high command have debated how best to respond to the tragedy. Some journals believe that the soldiers involved in the incident should be arrested. Quick and public arrests are what the public wants and would put an end to any thoughts of rebellion. Plus, those men who fired on the civilians, their arrest is a matter of morality. However, other members of the high command argue that the soldiers were acting in self-defense. The rioters were the ones who instigated the violence. Arresting the soldiers would make the government look inept and severely damage morale. In the end, Rokosovsky had this final word. Justice for the fallen... It was self-defense. Um, I really want to arrest them. That seems better. I do like getting... I don't want to lose political power. I really don't want to lose political power, but it really doesn't matter too much, I guess, for now, even though it does matter a little bit because we do need to crack down on our enemies here, so... A difference of opinion. Uh, Konstantin... Kons Konstantinovich, you may be good at what you do, but my friend, have you been wearing bad, bad word blinders? Rokosovsky glared at Batov and retorted, I could just say the same. Our children's toys consist of shrapnel and wiring just yesterday. I saw a man mugged only inches from our HQ. Yes, the invaders pushed Russia into senseless violence. And will we fix with more violence? Tell me, what separates the state-employed thugs from the regular ones? Duty for one, how naive must must one be to attack the very men who keep him breathing? Enforcement is the only thing standing between civilization and anarchy. Armed men serving a higher purpose, you cannot reason with a bear as it, as it charges you. It, it is simply fight or die. Batov chuckled, both in the metaphor and Rokosovsky's juvenile grandstanding. The man seemed convinced that he was a sole guardian of civilization against ravenous hordes. Batov prepared his retort, a self-assured grin crossing his lips. However, before he could dispense it, he froze with alarm, not noticing a change. Rokosovsky had gone pale again, and a terrible coughing fit gripped his body, shaking the general of his horse. When he finally reached its end, Batov pressed forward a glass of water, but Rokosovsky flippantly rejected him. Old friend, perhaps it's time to discuss your health? Uh, yes, it's always good to make sure your health is okay. I should listen to my own advice sometimes, but whatever. 
bedroom candles. Oh, who's coming in? The recruiter came to Anatoly's house again. His father, whose joints creaked along with the wooden floorboards, moved to answer the call. In his darkly lit bedroom, Anatoly waited for his old man to return. The recruiter needed to understand that much <clears throat> as Anatoly would like to fight in the front lines, his sick father needed him more. He stared at the flames gnawing on the wick of a slowly melting candle as it burned into his eyes. But your son is of age. A firm, resolute voice echoed through the hallways of the small house. It faded, becoming faint booms and reverbs, its words blurring with the evening's noise. <clears throat> the neighbor's dog was barking and a mild breeze stirred the earth. Officer, I beg your pardon, his father said, words laden with fatigue and age, but I need him. Surely you understand, boom and reverb. The voices moved back and forth, parrying, attacking, or posting. To Anatoly, it did not matter one whit. He heard the door slam closed, the impromptu reception was over. When the old man returned, Anatoly helped him lift his legs and arms under the bed, bouncing his head on a rag, dirty pillow. The light illuminated his father's face, and the gray hair became threads of silver under the glimmer of the faint candle fire. Do not live the life of a soldier, Anatoly heard him say. Do not, do not. He drifted to the realm of sleep and snored. No other option but home. Hey, get more political power to make up for... Eh, that's not too bad. 0.54, not great, but we like that more. Low religious influence on the passing of one's father. So, the recruiter said, his voice bubbling with concern, is your father well? No, Anatoly said. Fragments of the conversation came to him in the dark bedroom where his father slept. Tonight, too, his father had been unable to rise and attend to his duties. Anatoly found himself beside the candle with a flame gnawing on the wick, springing an aroma of melting lard, perfume for tormented soul. In the depths of his fatigue and exhaustion, Anatoly sat beside the bed. Anatoly did not know the nature of the sickness that plagued his father. Once, his old man had been had a healthy complexion and a slight paunch before belied the outline of his belly. Those excesses were gone. Where there was once fat, only bone remained. Where there were energy and drive, only fatigue and lethargy settled. He could not walk, his hands regularly shook, as if alive and separated from his will. Anatoly knew that his father's <coughs> excuse me, father's time quickly approached. <coughs> he stared at that gently snoring face, a visage of genteel illness. Maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow. Anatoly resigned himself to that of to that fact. If he had been elsewhere, Finland, Sweden, or Norway, his father might have been all right. Rising from his wooden worn stool, he made for his room, stealing a glance at his father before leaving. By the stroke of midnight, he heard the snoring cease. And so ends another life in the district. How sad. That is unfortunate, ma'am. Unfortunate. Deserters in the ranks. Corporal Melnikov fished up the last of his borscht served for him, savoring every last drop of the savory soup. It was a long time since he had anything warm to eat, and he wasn't sure when the next time he would have one would be. As he looked up, the rest of his squad seemed to be enjoying the soup too. It's getting late. Do you want to stay for the night? The age uh, Veselchislav Yakolov asked him. It had been a long time since anyone came to his cottage, so he wasn't sure if there'd be room for guests, but he thought it would be the least the polite thing to do. We'd love to say some more, but I'm afraid we must continue our mission, the corporal replied. HQ will be very disappointed if we are late. Yakolov nodded. He was surprised that when Melnikov and his squad appeared outside his cottage that afternoon, but the corporal explained that they were on a classified mission from Sverdlovsk that nobody must know, so it made sense that they must make haste. As the night fell, the squad traversed the vast forest that surrounded the cottage. It was difficult to see the stars, but luckily Melnikov had smuggled a map from the offices. As they crouched down and gazed at it, a warmth they didn't feel since leaving the old man's house entered their faces. A short walk southwest, and they'd finally cross the border to Chimen, to freedom. We must implement harsher restrictions. Oh boy. Or, we must give incentives to stay. We're currently at 57%. Mm, I kind of want that one, but... We're really hurting ourselves at the recruitment drive. Put your name and age, Baker said to the recruit, on this form, please. As a lieutenant of the district, he had seen many, many women who signed for a tour of service. Some chose a life because of patriotic sentiments, a heroic thing to do, but some did not live up to the expectations of the, by their intentions. Others set out... Uh, others out of sheer pragmatism. This category of people Baker sympathized with. After all, Rokosovsky did not deal in uh, little things in ro rubles, but bread and soup. The man who faced him, however, belonged in the same hole that Baker once did. People who had no choice but to sign up for the dirty work of operating machines that kill. The prospective recruit looked worn, t worn, rough, and shorn. Long, unkempt hair and a four o'clock shadow emerged, slowly emerging from that chim. The man looked desperate, destitute. Thin as well, Baker could not believe that he was only 18. Glib. Gleb had rec recommended this desolate, deprived person. Father was a friend, Gleb said, and beside, he was of age. An orphan, then. The allegedly young man filled the form and showed it to Baker. Twenty sighed. Anatoly Danilovich Morozov. Thin, unkempt, twig shall be his name. If there were anyone else, Baker would have crossed out their old names and give them their new so uh, superquettes. As things stood, he could not help but bring himself to do so. Proceeded to the medical office, Baker said, and if the doc says yes, I'll have you knitted out and sent to boot. An almost imperceptible nod, just before Anatoly left, how however. Baker patted his soldiers. You're in good hands, Baker said. I've been through the same things. It's all right. Tears simmered into a sob. Yes, Anatoly said. Thank you. 
Anatoly Danilovich Morozov accepted into service. Oh man, plus one manpower. Oh boy. And defend your mother. Oh, well, we'll read about the two principals. The drill instructor waited until the last batch of recruits. A scrawny runt named Anatoly Morozov was seated before he began. Set up straight dogs, look at me right now, he shouted, his voice like thunder, dozens of backs straightened. Some recruits jumped in their seats. He introduced himself as Sergeant Kut Kut Kutuzov, who and also introduced the two officers flanking him as Sergeants Tereshenko and Vazin. Our mission is to train each of you to become a soldier of the Ural Military District. A soldier of the district possesses courage, bravery, confidence, and integrity. He's the finest warrior in all of Russia. Am I clear? Yes, sir. A soldier of the district understands two things. One, he is Russian, and therefore his duty is to protect the Russian people. You are not here for revenge. You are not here for glory. You are here because you owe it to the millions of fellow Russians crushed under Hitler's boot. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Two, he is part of the Third Army, and therefore his loyalty is to the Third Army. You'll be just as loyal to your fellow soldier as you will be to me or Batov or Rokosovsky himself. Each and every man sitting in this room depends on you giving it everything you've got. That, as well as your devotion to forging a new, stronger, safer Russia, is all we ask of you. Understand these two things, and, and I will not fail in my goal as just as you will not fail in yours. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Nice little thing of propaganda. Hey, more political power, manpower, and st war support. Nice. Defend your mother. The purpose of the military district has been clear from the very beginning. Protection, not expansion. Under Marshal Rokosovsky, has directed and dedicated itself to the security of Russians living under its rule. In a Russia torn by genocidal violence and ideological extremism, mere ideals of milk toast reform cannot sustain the livelihoods of millions. A firm but gentle hand must guide their way to the future, shielding them from danger within and without. All who join the district shall receive a rifle, rations of pay. These are three means that enable men to defend his family, father, mother, sons, and daughter, whether brother, sibling, sister, or stranger. One more pair of hands shall ensure that no more lives will be lost. There are dangers abound, but with the people marching forward hand in hand with the district, they shall know no fear. Nice, more political power and worse I'm glad we're getting more political power. Uh, let's go and do one of these next. I want to do what? What happens if we get rid of it? Oh, are, are these both medium now? Oh, I'm still low. I'm going to go revisionist. Um, that's not going to do anything. All it does is make you lose political power. This one gives you, does actually some more, so let's do this one next. Hard times. And there we go. Galina Artyonomova gritted her teeth as she carefully measured out the food on the counter, calculating the best way to divide the day's rations. Her breathing was labored as she realized there was, no, there was 425 grams less of cabbage than she thought. Why did they have to reduce vegetable rations? She thought. No matter. She can do this. She was a sole adult in the house, so she needed the most food. No, it was the children who needed it the most, but which child? She looked at the three children playing in the corner. Deninska, Katya, and Olesk. Deninska was the oldest, but it was worth letting him grow while the younger children starved? No. Olesk, the youngest child, needed the, the, the food the most. Galina stood there, glancing back between the children and the rations on the counter. She divided them and counter divided the food in again and again, trying to calculate the best way to split the food before screaming and collapsing into her chair. It was only... If only Kirill was here. If she could listen to him laugh, maybe she could regain the strength to finish her work again. And just like that, as she opened her eyes, there was Katya with a package and a letter in hand. Don't be sad, Mommy. Daddy sent us a present from the army. Katya opened the package and began to laugh. Laughed at the winds of fate that caught her in this very minute. Laughed at the joke that was coming, that was her life. Laughed at the contents of the package. Rations, military issue, canned vegetables, 425 grams. <laughs> Recruit civilians into the militia? We need them in the factories. Oh, we get authoritarian socialism anyways. You get a lot more manpower. Or we get more political power, we lose stability and war support. Ooh. Well, we get political power. Or we lose political power. Hmm. Manpower will become an issue later on, so. Let's do that one. I don't want to lose stability and war support. And does anyone have. No? No one has stuff yet. Okay, well, whatever. And then trust in the Marshal. The Great Marshal Rokosovsky, formerly of the Union, now controls what little remains of the military district. To the people of Svedlovsk, he rep represents a final desperate hope of stability and liberty. The burden imposes such strain on his physique as he takes it on the responsibility for millions. His soldiers, staff members, and people beg to recon reconsider his task, to delegate his duty and rest. He refuses a lone man against the advancing tide of tyranny and authoritarian rule. As such, there is no other course of action than to trust the marshal to do his obligation. From all levels of society, from the, the military district, also take the marshal at his word, that he has experienced and thus knows best. From the beggars in the homeless of the cities and villages to the highest echelons of command in their Spartan quarters, all will look to the marshal as a beacon of life, liberty, and happiness amid a Russia torn by war and chaos, which will get more division recovery rate and stability and authoritarian democracy. Cool. And we just get a little bit more uh, research speed, which will help out, but we'll see what happens as we're doing some land auction here too. Divisionist influence. Oh, we can't even scan for loot yet. God dang it. That sucks. Low and low, which is good. But we'll see what happens. Trust in the marshal. More war support? That's not too bad. Fortifying homes? Oh, let's do that one just in case. 
<clears throat> they return every month, sometimes in broad daylight, sometimes at night, but they always come, and they always c come back, no matter how many times, how many they kill, no matter how much destruction they wreck from thousands of feet in the air. The Luftwaffe is a persistent danger to not only our people, but our administration, and we should spare no expense in mitigating the damage the bombings cause. If we cannot repel them outright, then we shall send our military units out to fortify homes, and hopefully save lives in the next raid. The Revisionist Propaganda Dmitry Ol Olegovich Chaban sighed as he looked at the letter slumping down in the barracks bed. They've cut the city rations again, he said to his friend. Private Ab Agapov, ever get the feeling that this isn't how socialism is supposed to be like? They told us everyone would be equal and now we're all equally starving. Of course, Agapov said, it's a vanguard party of workers who are supposed to lead the revolution to victory. A bunch of generals pretending to be socialists are just military dictators under another name. And this is Olegov. Olegovich. The reason why our families are striving is because the brass doesn't care about anything but their own selfish gain. That's why the old Soviet Union failed. You know, want to, want to know the real way forward, the real path of socialism? Uh, Chaban nodded. Anything would be better than this husk of an army pretending to be a country. Agapov took out a worn pamphlet from his pocket and handed it to Chaban. The title read Stalinism, the way of the future. Search them out. Har place harsh restrictions on the military. I don't want to lose war support, but we're going to lose it anyways. We can lose manpower. So be it. So be it. This is not a very good position we're in. Uh, we could raid two men, but I don't think I want to. They have a lot of manpower as well. And, yeah, they have that tank division, which is not very good for us. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, 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 boy. Simple kindness. And the heart of Svedlosk. A stranger walked without purpose. Thankfully, the day was overcast enough to ground the German bombers. The man had come into town the previous night to turn in a bounty on a local group of bandits and take in residence in a local flophouse. As he walked through the streets of Sverdlovsk, he passed by a small park. It was called, to call it a park was perhaps too generous of a statement. It was just the largest patch of unblemished parkland left in the city. Still, he strolled through the area and observed those around him. On days like this, without the risk of German bombs, families could be seen enjoying a rare day of peace. To be sure, there was not many of them, but those were the, but that there that were there filled the stranger's heart with a strange warmth. It had been so long since he had seen such peace amongst any of the people of Russia. He came atop of the hill, a small hill. Scarred by bombs and scorned by the people of Sverdlovsk, he sat on the lip of a small crater, looking out at the people he had passed by. Before he could get too far into his reminiscing, he heard a small sneeze behind him. Turning, he saw the source. At the bottom of the crater sat a small girl no older than six years old. She looked at him in shock, eyes wide, looking around for the girl's parents, he motioned for her to join him. Come here, little one, where are your parents, he asked, still searching. I don't know, I can't find them, she spoke, her voice quivering on the edge of tears. Before she could break down in hysterics, the stranger held up his hand. Come along, we'll find him. Uh, the man sh took her hand in his and brought her down the hill. They spent almost an hour searching for her parents, but in the end they found them. The two looked like they had been r and ragged, their faces twisted in panic. The little girl rushed from his side to her parents as they sagged in relief. Before they could thank him, he had melted into the crowd and disappeared. A simple moment of kindness. Fortifying homes? Yeah, we definitely got this one. And then bomb shelters? And we need as much division on defense core territory as possible because we don't have enough PP. Which is bits, big sadness, but you know, it is what it is. You grow... These, none of these guys have enough. Ah. The aviators of the military district. The anti-aircraft gunners stationed <clears throat> on the hill outside Svedlovsk prepared their battery for action. Scouts stationed on the western side of the city had reported an incoming German bomber formation and they tended to be ready. With their outdated equipment, the gunners knew well that they were unlikely to actually impede the bombers in any appreciable fashion or stop them from completing their mission of terror and death, but they knew equally well that they had to try. That they had to strike back against a hated German in any way possible and in doing so save or solve the despair currently endemic to the Russian consciousness. As the formation came into view, large black ovoids far above, the lead, lead gunner arranged them as best as he was able to and prepared to open fire just as he was about to, however. His sergeant grabbed his arm and pointed to the sky. A swarm of smaller dots had emerged from the clouds, pouncing upon the bomber formation before it had a chance to concentrate itself. Every Russian in the district knew what that meant, and he prayed for as much as they could, often to no avail, but this time they had been heard, and the aviators had arrived. The gunners knew that they should be firing nonetheless, as the aviators were not integrated into the district's military command structure, but they did not. No one dared risk hitting one of the aviators flying high above, and though it was technically, technically a violation of orders, they knew that their officers would overlook it, for they felt the same as the gunners themselves, the same as any true Russian. As several of the bombers began trailing smoke and flame, the gunners shared a cheer. A victory, minuscule as it might be, had been won, and the legend of the aviators continued to grow. If only they would fly for the district. <clears throat> Alright, trust in the marshal. Bomb shelters deter the tyrant. A soldier's law. Uh, comrade Artyomov, what's wrong with your boots? Barked Sergeant Pavlov. What, comrade? Uh, Private Karel Artyomov responded. They aren't shining properly. They look like you've been stepping in crap. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. You better be sorry at the end of the afternoon. Run five laps around the square when you're done. 
After inspection, Artyomov did the extra laps as required. It was difficult to run after the rations were cut once again after the fifth lap, he simply collapsed on the ground, exhausted and in pain. That evening, as he did drills, Artyomov lagged behind in the training exercises, nearly falling off the fence he was supposed to climb. As punishment, he was withheld dinner. As once again entered the barracks room as night fell, exhausted and starving, he wondered what exactly he did to deserve the day of hardship when the door opened, and one of his comrades entered the room. The next morning, he received a care package, apparently delayed by a day. He stared at it with disbelief as he opened it and stared at the contents, a can of vegetables and some meat from his wife. Huh. The circle has returned to its starting point. Oh, crap. We lose weekly manpower, uh, recruitable population factor, division recovery rate, wow, minus 50%, war support, and division defense for two months. Jesus. The view from 24A, prospect lending them. Konstantin sighed and let his report fall onto his desk, on top of a dozen other documents. His headache was killing him. He hauled himself to his feet. Stabs of pain ran up and down his back. He walked over to his window and leant on the sill. Dark, heavy clouds were massing over the horizon. Below, citizens scurried about Lenin Avenue. A truck carrying a handful of soldiers rumbled past. He was an old man with the weight of Russia and her people on his shoulders. How much longer did he have? A year, two, five? What he had accomplished? The Union collapsed, the WSPR collapsed, and Sverdlovsk was surrounded by enemies. Pavel, his appointed successor, was more than capable of leading, but he was no miracle man. He couldn't stop the bombings. He couldn't make more rations. He couldn't stop Kaganovich or Yazov. None of the state Sverdlovsk was currently in. Konstantin knew the, these thoughts were best left unsaid, but he had to be honest with himself. And even if he doubted himself from time to time, the people never did. He was Konstantin Rokosovsky, after all. An old man, yes, but also commander of the Third Army. Hero of the Soviet Union and benevolent guardian of the last bastion of freedom in all of Russia. If anyone had the medal to reclaim Russia, it was him. A stubborn smirk crept across his face. His face. He sat down and clicked on his desk lamp. He settled his glasses higher up on his nose and looked down at the report, picking up where he left off. He couldn't be... couldn't give up now. No, not ever. There was still too much work to be done. Trust in the marshal, for he trusts in you. Cast him down. I'd like to do this stuff. Um, fortified home would be nice. Even more defensive core territory. Extra rations. Ooh, we lose daily political power. Consumer goods factory does work very nicely. Industrial expertise does go up. Night shifts. That'd be really good to get. Ooh, we do get some more war support. I want to get more stability first. I do want to get this. But I do want that military factory pretty quickly because that'll come in very handily. Fortify the factories. The basic fact of the district's existence is clear to all. It is surrounded from all sides by organizations and factions that seek to dominate territory and people for sinister intentions. As such, it is imperative to keep the factories running lest they overrun the enemy or the army and achieve their aims. However, with the current weather, the, Ger the German bombs and shrapnel falling out of the sky, it is proven to be quite challenging to accomplish this feat. With decreasing output and industrial efficiency, the factories would not be able to get the equipment to the soldiers in time, dooming the district in the process. The marshal and his staff have come up with perhaps not the most original ideas, but a tried and true one. Labor battalions will work together with the engineer camps to reinforce the factories by any means necessary. Camouflage them, hide them, fortify them, but with no message or method shall be beyond the reach of the district. Cool. And there's nothing else we can do here, which kind of sucks, but that's okay. Yeah, we're going to lose political power for quite a while. We'll get 0.62 every day, which is okay. It's not great, but not bad. Um, the only really redeeming thing we have here is this line here. But I do want that military factory because we are trying to make cavalry divisions just so we can move faster. As well as the anti-tank divisions just because, well, as we saw earlier, two men has tanks. And if we have no piercing, then we're kind of sucked. We're kind of sucked? We kind of suck then. Hey, at least power tools are going up, though. Hey, two a month. Not bad. Ah, very good. That'll help us out. And attrition planning for even more defense and max training. Max entrenchment, I should say. Defense and organization. Very good. Um, anyone have loot? Do you men? How about Zotaust? Nope. Oh, we can't raid the free aviators, which makes sense. An ultimatum from Yugra. They're demanding that we hand over the loot, but if you want to read about that, please go ahead. Actually, we're pretty much prepared for them, so we're not going to back down so easily. Let them come in. Actually, this is really good. This is what I've been waiting for. So if we went on defense, they would get more, you know, guns and maybe a slightly more stability, maybe the political power or something. So, yeah, they're not that strong. That's why I'm not too upset by playing here. So we got more political power, rifles, and stability. Great. Things that we could all use. Uh, up next. Which one is worse right now? They're both pretty bad. Do, do the one about two men. Not bad. Yeah, this guy's not too bad either. And Orkosovsky, actually... Ooh, he has two traits. I like this one. I might go aggressive as a soldier. I want to wait first, so I want to see how hard these guys actually hit us, so... We'll see. Another batch. Vyshelslav, Yakovlev, saw the two men in tattered uniforms approach him from the wheat fields that afternoon. The old man stopped his tailing and immediately approached them. Hello, said the first tattered man. I am Gennady Kuznetsov, and this is my comrade Evgeny Orogov. We are... <clears throat> on a top secret mission to two men, Yakovlev asked. The two soldiers looked at each other. If you need shelter, I've got a spare bedroom upstairs. Let's go. 
That evening, Yakovlev and the two soldiers sat down for dinner. The soldiers exchanged some of their rations to Yakovlev, and he was able to make some hearty per pierogies for them. So heading to Tiamen, huh? I suggest taking a right at the next nearest intersection and following the road until you get to the closest town across the border. You can head out early morning next morning and walk all day there, or you can head out at noon and camp by the lake. Thank you, comrade. We'll stay tonight and leave the next morning. Rogov said, by the way, do you know how much... How do you know so much about us and our mission? Yakovlev smiled. Let's just say I've known some of your friends for quite some time now. And here we go again. Hmm. Cool. Fortifying the homes. Because we need to. And then fortify the factories. Absolutely. Get more Warsport too, which is also a plus. Cool. Up next, we got a... I want that one so badly, but night shifts. Right? Is it night shifts? Yes, it is. For many workers, the notion of going to work at a factory in Svedlosk terrifies them. The shifts mostly take their places during the day, where the fac factory is visible from the air, making them prime targets for German bombing. The sight of a plane from far away is enough to get the whole factory up floor on their knees. An explosion will send them scurrying away, too scared to work for another day. Those who sign up for these jobs are heroes, but we fear for them as they do for their lives. They are skilled workers and technicians at the front cannot afford to lose. The civilian administration has advised the marshal and his staff to move these shifts to nighttime. Rokosovsky shall lend an ear to a suggestion. Workers shall move and work in the night to prevent lost to random German bombs tearing through the sky. The Germans may have, have thought us dead and cornered, but we shall find ways to overcome them. Oh, we can do against Ugra now? Actually, how strong is Ugra? Two to four divisions. They're exactly like us. Uh, they're a little bit weaker than us, so we might do well. Let's see what happens. They might actually bow down to us. Hopefully we don't lose here. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. This guy's still not too bad, though. Loyalty. Private Karel Z Zadochin shot a couple of nervous glances around the old school gym where he and the rest of the 39th Rifles Battalion were standing as he waited for the commissary to discuss the results of the compulsory loyalty tests. Two months ago, almost as his entire squad was found to be insufficiently loyal and his comrades were never seen again. And last month, they took away his remaining friends in from his village in a different platoon. What if he named is what if he was named as disloyal? He thought. Commissar Vorobia marched into the room in full dress uniform. A smile like a wolf who found himself in a pen of sheep. Zadochin closed his eyes, but nothing could have prepared him for what. Vorobyev would say next. Congratulations! The entire company, including Zadachin, who opened his eyes, stared at the commissar in disbelief. Comrades, not only are those there are no disloyal members in this unit, HQ has named you to be the most loyal in the entire army. In honor of your reliability, this unit will be now known as the 15 Guards Rifles Battalion. The ceremony where your new standard will be presented is next Wednesday. The price of loyalty is high, but the rewards are even higher. We get way more stability, we lose authoritarian socialism, and remove not so red army, which is very, very good for us because we get 10% more organization. We get more recruitable population factor, which will be very nice for us. And we get more planning speed, which is not bad. I'll take it. Beautiful, my friends. Absolutely beautiful. Just like all of us here. Well, maybe not all of us, but, you know, whatever. <sighs> if that's the case, um, I'm going to wait to do more max and We literally might need that, so we'll see what happens. They refuse tribute. And we should. We might be able to beat them up fast enough, maybe. Maybe not. We'll see what happens. They did start off, start off a little weaker than us. And can we beat them before they get some more guys? Oh, yeah, we are... Our organization was hurt, but an irregular occurrence. A most curious incident has occurred along the northern borders. A detachment from the 364th Rifle Regiment intercepted a significant force of bandits from Yugra who were in pursuit of a peculiar group waving the American flag. According to the testimony of Lieutenant Romanov, the group appears to be mostly composed of deserters from Yugoda's Far Eastern Soviet, but most curiously seems to be headed by an American of all people. The American who goes by Steve told Romanov that he was a tourist who was exploring Russia and presented proof to support, uh, to support his wild claim, including a genuine American passport and a ticket to Magadan. While some in the group appeared to be seasoned veterans and may have posed a threat, Romanov deemed Steve to pose a arrest to the district and escorted the group to Svedlos. An American? Well, it won't hurt to show him around, I guess. And a successful raid. Beautiful, my friends. Absolutely yummy, yummy, yummy. And we're allowed now by... Oh, this guy's really good on attack. Not bad. This is what happens when you don't agree with us. Yeah, I'm going to wait for this one. Victory? Very good. Very good. Food for the Hungry. Entry 21, Svedlosk. Zoya had told me that Svedlosk had broken away from the West Siberian Republic under the rule of Amasha Rokosovsky, the so-called Lion of Siberia. While she knew little of their rule, she had heard that Rokosovsky governed with a much lighter hand compared to the Leninists and two men, considering their patrols hadn't fired at sight. I'd say she was heard correctly. <clears throat> After a short interrogation during which I recounted my tale of being a Yankee tourist and presented some documents to pr prove it, I, along with the rest of the group, was escorted to Svedlosk all proper, albeit under armed guard. While the group was under constant watch, life in Svedlosk seemed quite tolerable. The soldiers were friendly, and the people seemed content under the rule of the marshal. We were provided with adequate accommodations in our local barracks and treated to a passable meal. Not as good as what we were given in Omsk, but a definite step up from eating canned food while freezing the Urals. The next morning, we were treated to a parade by a rifle division. 
It was quite a sight. Rows upon rows of well disciplined soldiers marching in their near locked up, punctuated by 21 gun salute from an artillery battery. For sure, it's a darn sight better than what the Minnesota National Guard regularly shows off. I think Zoya and the others thought so too. She said that the last time she saw a parade like this was years ago, right before the Siberian War between the Far Eastern Soviet and the Central Siberian Republic. After spending a bit more time in the city and purchasing additional provisions, we said goodbyes to Svedlosk. Our next destination is Latelsk, who have been told are arms dealers of some repute or repute. Zoya says we shouldn't expect any trouble, and I'm quite eager to see what a country run by gunners looks like. Not bad, but Omsk was better. And right now, which one is worse? Uh, low resistance. I guess we'll do medium resistance for these guys. Cool. The Black League. Very nice. And if we finally get an extra factory, which would be nice. Ah, extra factories, please. Papers, please. Actually, I should play that game someday. It's been a long time since that game came out, but I don't think I've ever played it. And what do we have here? Oh, we have a lot of things here. Wait, why do we... Honestly, I didn't set this up at all, apparently. I forgot about setting this up. My bad. Oh, we don't need that one. This is one of the times I actually forgot to set things up off screen. We're going to need some arty. We're going to need a lot of anti-tank. I'll get some APCs as well. And anti-air. Nope. We got enough. Oh, yeah. We're definitely going to need a lot of this stuff here. So that's not too bad. We're going to need some main battle tanks. And then we're going to need some fighters and some casts while getting rid of these things. Because we don't need to see these things. Thank you. Over here. Goodbye. All right. So we... How many infantry rods apples do we have? We have 1,100. Holy crap, that's a lot. All right, so that's the case. We can cut this down. I don't know why we had two here. I don't, yeah, my bad. There you go. Now we have enough for this and that. Um, let's go to two here as well. Put you up one, and I don't want to lower this anymore. Ooh, actually, we need... Well, really, one, two, three. Let's go down by one. At least start working on some sort of artillery for now. We'll go up to two here. You know, I can lower by one, too. That's fine. At least we're working on anti-tank. We get one a week. It's not bad, not great, but we'll just scam sure it anyways. Cool. Nice shifts. Uh, stability and political power. Oh, no. That didn't give us hurt or, or worse, but that's not too bad, then. I want to do that. Expertise will go up more and more. It's better to do this earlier than later. But let's do bomb shelters just in case. We do get more defense of core territory. It's no secret that the city of Svedlosk is a Luftwaffe's main target, and that is exactly why we must insulate it for as, from as much damage as possible. Sandbags, camouflage, and the occasional prayer aren't enough. Underground bomb shelters are the best way to protect the citizens of Svedlosk, while these shelters won't save the city's infrastructure, and the bombings severely hinder our abilities to provide for our citizens. We can rebuild factories and repair roads. Casualties are not something we can't afford. Absolutely. Anyway, I never do the warlord of because it just doesn't mean too much. Oh. Uh, oh wait, so to get rid of this Black League influence, uh, how much influence do they have? Do we can we just get rid of it? Uh, maybe we can just get rid of it. You know what? Next time we'll do this, we're gonna try to get rid of it as best as possible. Bomb shelters, yay! So now we have one to two to one to two. Not too bad, not too bad. Could be a lot worse. Three months is not good for this, but whatever. Mongolian civil war, and then uh, cast them down. Anti air is okay. Get some landforts. Let's grab some landforts next to deter the tyrant. To herself, Lazar Kaganovich and his clique of tyrants clinging to the mantle of the Western Siberian People's Republic with dogged zeal. This totalitarian government is antithetical to our ideals of freedom and liberty. He watches us, wasting, waiting for the slightest lapse in preparedness to strike and lay waste to everything we have built. For now, he cannot to launch a major offensive with the threat of Luftwaffe air raids will be suicidal, but the bombings will not stop him forever. We must fortify our border to deter such an attack until the time comes that we are ready to put this tyranny, or his tyranny, to an end. Oh, the dust. Come on, boys, let's move on over. And let's entrench ourselves firmly and deeply. <clears throat> These guys are probably not too easy to beat, but that's alright. Oh, ours, wow, our capital's right on the border. That is not good. <clears throat> not good. We're almost there, and... <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, boy. They're throwing more divisions in. But so are we. Oh, the Raganov. They have a, that's a lot of guys. They have a lot of manpower. Hopefully we don't lose here, but it looks like we might just lose. Which is going to suck. That really sucks. There's nothing we can do here. Our guys are just too weak. That's so stupid. That is so stupid, man. Yeah, I don't know. Why did you give us a crappy general? Ugh, Jesus Christ. Garrison Slider. God dang it, that sucks. 
Yeah, that's so stupid. I'm going to murder Z Zatalsan. I'm going to straight up murder him and hang Dragunov's body from a random tree. <clears throat> this is why we need more defense of core territory. To make up for it, we're going to beat up Yugura. Hey, let's get that one done. And there you go. Alright, and then, this is why I want to get more defense on Korotator with them. Cast them down. The bombs fell, such as a simple fact in Russia. Further east, perhaps, across the Euro Mountains, many Russians find, if not solace and calm, a semblance of silence. However, for many in Svedlosk, from the army to the civilians, the option of retreating beyond the mountains is nothing more than a pipe dream. The bomb shelters are in securing the safety of our people, giving them space away from the terror that the Germans unload on Russian soil every single day. However, maybe even that would not be enough. Perhaps it is time to explore other avenues of action. A good offense, a Chinese general once said a long time ago, is the best defense. The engineer corps will work with the labor battalions of the district to construct anti-air emplacements throughout the district. No longer shall they reign suffering through without impunity. While the army watches without a response, they shall find their bombs matched with flak rounds without mercy. Time enough. We have spent uncowering. It is time to cast them down. Get some more organization first. God, that sucks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of Dragunov. He is going to pay for what he's done here. Alright, they don't want to show up. We will win. Hopefully. And we're going to focus on the revisionists. Oh, we can sketch for loot, though. That'd probably be good to do, too. Come on, show up so we can beat you up. What is it? How many days do you have to wait before these guys actually show up? Come on, you go die, 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 die. There you go. Cast him down. At least we got, we won there, but, Jesus. And they chose an even worse general to lead that. I don't understand how the AI chooses it. It doesn't make any sense. It was war, at least we got that one. We got our stability and war spark back. And anything else here yet? Nope. And that's fine with us. High influence? Oh boy. Well, there's nothing we can do when we can always lose PP. Come on, crack down on revisionists, please. The Tiger of the East roars once more. All right. Bulgaria sides with Italy. That's nice. There you go. We'll do that one. Cast him down, and then assemble to safety. The bombs still fall over Russia, such as the fact of life in the district. From the east, the tyrant Kaganovich still eyes us, but the forts deter his raiders and drive him away. The Germans still prowl the sky, but now the, the hold does not go unchallenged. Men and women manning the anti-air emplacements present a credible challenge against the bombers, who now act, cannot act with impunity against the Svedlosk civilian and military population. The whole district rejoices. Its people, from the marshal to the lowest worker, have stumbled upon safety or semblance of it. Some unfortunate bombs still find their targets, and Kaganovich's wolves raid us for resources and loot. However, the fact remains that the people are more secure than ever, with the army doing its best to protect them from harm. The marshal expects his people to put this space of relief to good use. More stability, authoritarian democracy, more monthly population, division in defense of core territory, and we get daily life. And I apologize for my sp fast speaking, it's just sometimes we gotta move quickly in life. More equipment. It's good, it's low still, and a semblance of safety followed up with make things better. Uh, I don't know this political power. I do want to get that one, but that one doesn't really matter as much. But we get more output. Stability would be good. We could use that political power immediately to help lower their influence. Life in Russia is not good. German bombing is a fact of life, and violence pervades wherever a local warlord is unable to exercise its power. In the district, however, under the leadership of the venerable Marek Rokosovsky, the people of Sverdlovsk enjoy the highest standards of living on this, this side of Russia. The military arm of the district only exists for the protection of all who live in it. Though life is hard, its people do not go hungry, nor do the cries pass unheard. The marshal should give the masses of the district a lesson from his own life, on how to make the best things or the best of things, here and elsewhere. Life is not by any means prosperous, nor comfortable, but the Marshal Shah has never given up hope. Through it all, he guides the people with a clear conscience and warm heart, providing them with the means to survive and live. They will take after his example and continue marching on to the future, no matter what dark fates may bring to their feet, and for all for a small spark of light at the end. Which is good. We can buy infantry equipment, we can raid against these guys, but I don't think I want to raid against Kaganovich. Oh, big boy. He's up to six divisions, which is... Really similar to us, actually, that's not too bad, but nice. Daily life. Once the status quo was untenable, the German bombers were slowly grinding us into dust. They destroyed our homes, damaged our roads, ruined our fruits and stockpiles, and neutered our military capabilities. Meanwhile, the tyrant to the south raided us time and time again, breaking our defenses and reaping the spoils. In fact, they were one and the same, a single unified force dedicated to destroying Sverdlovsk. 
Now our fortunes have shifted. What if you bombers crawl over Urals are met with our anti-aircraft fire, and the population of our cities have grown accustomed to the spasmodic bombing runs? Our fortifications have made each consecutive raid rather costlier and costlier for Kaganovich, and yet he still returns. The damages and casualties caused by both the bombings and raids have decreased exponentially, while the threat posed by the Germans and Kaganovich have become part of daily life. The civilians of Svedlos go about their duties with stoicism and bravery, comforted both by the fact that there are safety measures and place to protect them and the hope that one day neither will harm them ever again. A semblance of safety is safety nonetheless. So, if we keep going cracking down, will they do anything else? Or just let them just keep it all the way up? I don't know. We'll see what happens. Making the best of things and extra rations. The military arm of the district manages everything in Svedlosk. The people fully behind the ideals of the marshal and the unit he commands obey. Yet the factories of Svedlosk lag on the quotas, delivering fewer arms than the district needs demand. The workers set issues with long hours, arduous work, and the terror of the Germans as they fly above the workplace prime targets for the bombing. The workplace, uh, they are loyal... They, that they are loyal is not the question. That we need their service is a fact of the day. We're, we can never have enough workers. The district should begin with their most apparent problem, pay. Factory work is a dangerous job in Russia, and not all who wake up in the morning and toil with the machinery are happy with that fact. The marshal intends to lessen the burden these heroes carry by issuing them extra rations proportional to the work they have done. Under the district, these men and women shall have or know neither hunger nor lack, and out with a crash. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Now, let's see what happens. They're probably going to raid us again, but we'll see what happens. Oh boy, making the best of things, absolutely. Looking on the bright side, comparisons between the current standards of living and those of the pre-war union are pointless. They do nothing but drain morale and open the minds of power-hungry demagogues who will exploit the nostalgia. It is important to cherish that we have rather lament what we have found, or what we lack. Sverdlovsk is one of the safest cities in Russia outside of Nazi control, and her citizens enjoy a relatively high standard of living, certainly higher than most places to our east. The government and military are united in purpose. They exist to serve the people. Their concerns are heard and taken into account, and both their lives and livelihoods are protected from those who seek to destroy them. Finally, we have Marshal Rokosovsky, who leads us with dignity and indomitable resolve. He provides the citizens with everything they need to hatch out a life that may not be prosperous, but is sufficient. Men and women can safely go to work and bring home bread for their families in Russia, where violence is a law. That should be enough for now. Remember that things will get better, but they could always be worse. That is very, very true. At least we have a 5th division now. It's not very good. It's only a horse division, but it'll have to suffice for now. If anything, we can actually make it be probably 20 combat with if we really, really wanted to by using all those extra guns we did make. Uh, we probably don't have any APCs or anything like that. Probably. Yeah, we don't. But to make our guys beefier might be the thing we need to do. Because all they need... Oh, they need more anti-tank as well, which kind of sucks, but whatever. Now, if we were to do this... We have enough guns for them. We barely have enough guns. We need more anti-tank. But doing this will give us... Give our division a better fighting chance, probably. You know, it, there is a strategy where you... Well, that's not very good now. Oh, crap. Um, want to have as many divisions early on in the field. But I guess we're not doing that right now. Uh, revisionists. So what happens? Get events. Victories against revisionists. Oh, we do remove it. Okay. That's good. Crack down revisions. Okay, so that was my fat. My, my fat? My bad. I didn't know if this would actually remove this stuff or not. So let's just spend what we need right now. Because if we don't do it now, we're just going to waste PP later on. But now I know. And now you know too, hopefully as well. Cool. Our extra rations and a decent work environment. The issue of pay is settled. No workers who toil day and night for the district shall find themselves go unrewarded still. An issue of nerves. The long hours remain and the arduous work does not help matters. Not to say that the workers are ungrateful, however. From the benevolent palms of the marshal, they have gained a crucial concession for their livelihoods their, and their loyalty is forever. Recruitment and volunteer numbers are increasing to record levels and productivity has never been higher. The marshal intends to extinguish any more complaints that they might have. The long hours will go replaced by a system of shifts that will adhere to the patterns of activity of the Lufafum. Skilled overseers shall watch over the workers, preventing the work from being coming unbearable and exhausting as it rearrange the temple of craft. With no issues remaining, the civilians will march forever hand in hand with the district to triumph against the Black League and the tyrant Lazar. Good. And victory against revisionists. The Internal Security Bureau is at war, and this war has presented them with a unique challenge. The enemy combatants wear no uniforms, bear no armbands or symbols on their persons. They do not wield rifles and knives against us. Their weapons of choice are books, pamphlets, and propaganda. In this war, battles are fought and won in the minds of our soldiers, not on the battlefield. Thanks to the tireless work of the brave sons of Sverdlovsk and the ISB, our efforts in combating the persistent revisionist influence have been widely successful. The seditious Kaganovich, Kaganovichite elements operating within our borders view the general populace as sympathetic to the cause, which gave our operatives a perfect opportunity to infiltrate the organizations. Our men on the inside clandestinely leaked us information that allowed us to thwart the revisionist attempts to raid army stockpiles and disseminate pro-revisionist literature, and once the main base of these cells were pinpointed, they were struck from the map with a practice machine-like efficiency. Revisionist influence has taken 
a serious blow and it is unlikely they'll, they'll be able to recover. Tyrants have no place in Sverdlovsk or Russia for that matter. And now we have 59% stability. We were 58. We only got 1% because all the debuffs we currently get. But at least it's positive. That is something I can say. We have been successful at least with something in the very first episode. But now we're going to deal with that guy in Omsk. Karabyshev, right? Karabi, Karabi. Nope. Yazov is here now. Okay. Karabyshev is gone. Extra rations. A decent work environment. Which we all wish to have. Followed up with sanctioned scavengers. Long ago, before the foundation of the military district, Svedlok was part of the Western Siberian People's Republic, with a marshal as its unwilling head of the armed forces. A semblance of stability settled over the region, as the WSPR fought to the, undo the damage caused by the fall of the Union after the Great Patriotic War. Then the West Russian War came in support of its comrades to the West. The People's Republic dispatched as much as it can help as much help as it can, whether in the form of food, weapons, or clothing. They defeated the Western Russian Revolutionary Front, and infighting within its ranks rendered all aid sent moot. Before the terror bombings commenced, the Republic moved the surplus throughout Siberia, with the majority of it remaining in Sverdlovsk untouched. The district shall now rescind the restriction on civilian scavenging. These stockpiles may hold valuable resources still, a remnant of the past still, giving life to those living in the present. We're almost done with research speed with that stuff. That's good. And we can buy stuff. Now we're okay. Cool. And this is next. Clacking down on the Black League. The shadow spreads. Comrade Lieutenant Private Davidov saluted his officers to enter the office. Private Davidov, Lieutenant Koltov, replied, What brings you here today, comrade? Uh, there's something I want to talk about, the private replied. You see, one of my squad mates, Comrade Morozov, is kind of funny. He sort of talks about a great trial that's going to happen soon, and how it's going to lead to the rebirth of Mother Russia. Today, he gave me a pamphlet about it, and I thought, you should see it. Davidov handed the lieutenant the pamphlet. It was black with a white edge and the words of the great trial printed on top of it. Thank you for get telling me this, comrade, Lieutenant Koltov said. You may go back to your quarters. Brevet Davidov saluted the lieutenant and left. Closing the door, Lieutenant Koltov took out the phone again and began making a call. Hello, uh, comrade uh, Colonel. Yes, it's me, Lieutenant Koltov. I found another ultra nationalist in the ranks. Split the worst agitators. Start cracking down. Do that one because I don't want to hurt uh, authoritarian democracy. Yugra, ah, Yugra, time for your daily beatings. Wow, they're looking really bad. Yeah, that's why it's not too bad playing a Svedlosk right now. And you get a lot of defense on Quartetto, they have no manpower left. So, it is what it is. Beautiful. Let's go. And, oh, and the Far East is, oh, nice. Killing itself now, good. And we got more PP, which is exactly what I wanted. So, awesome, awesome, awesome. Screw you, you off. And we are there. Good. Followed up with Sanction Scavengers. Nice. And followed up with that one will be a silent morning. It all stops one day. The uh, sirens remain calm. It's left silence by the lack of incoming danger. Many thought it was a fluke, but that the Germans would soon return and dominate the skies and the bombs shall fall again upon Russia without care, thought, or mercy. Yet they never return. The clouds are quiet. There was no planes in sight. The rumors were right. The Germans are gone, under pressure from their internal conflicts. The AA emplacements, the free aviators, have been withdrawn. The marshal, along with the rest of the district, breathes a sigh of relief. More dangers remain in the future, however. The shadow merchants of Zatos and their indecipherable intent, the enigmatic and mysterious Black League, and the remnants of the West Siberian People's Republic under Lazar Kaganovich, will soon compete with Svedlovsk to be the premier power of the region. Time is of the essence. Conflict nears by every second. Looking up. And what is your opinion of Omsk and the Black League, comrade Chernov? Oh, they were just a bunch of reactionaries. I don't know why I listen to them. It has been a week since ultra national agitator Private Anatoly Morozov was transferred from his unit to a garrison post on the other side of the country. Komis Tsar Egorov was assigned to his duty or unit to perform regular checkups on the loyalty of the units where ultra, ultra nationalists have been spreading counter revolutionary propaganda. That's okay, comrade Egorov said. It's only natural for people to start spouting Nazis when they all have. But all they have around them are bad influences. However, you've ranked the highest on your loyalty test since Mark Marikov's resignment. Reassignment. How's he doing? Am I, if I am allowed to ask, does he still hold ultra-national sympathies? No, comrade. He hasn't spoken that much ever since being transferred, especially not about the Black League. He's still being watched by commissars, but we're thinking about ending his parole soon. Good to hear. Lights will always disperse a shadow. At least you hope so. Oh, we can scavenge loot. Nice. Good, good, good. And what are we at right now? We are currently at high influence. Oh, that's not good. Is this going to do ultra high? Very high. Oh, God. Well, at least we got rid of this guy, which is most important to do right now, but... Hmm. Not bueno. And we can only get 0.48. Man, it just seems like it's keep going down. And Central Siberia is to, uh, to fall apart now. Yay! And we're still going to scavenge for loot. Our horses are not looking good. Oh, now are they? Uh, could be a lot worse. That's actually looking a little better than it was before. Artillery's not, uh, still not looking good, but it is what it is. 
Uh, Army reserve training, very nice, very, very nice. And infrastructure reserve, because we can. And, oh, well, I guess we have to wait until this fires. So, allow scavenging of materials. Well, I guess we'll end that episode here, in which tomorrow we'll probably end up going to war with everyone here in Western Siberia. But if you enjoyed the episode, please do consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow, as we are going to struggle greatly, probably against TMM and others. Thanks for watching, have a tremendous rest of your day.